Hello, welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness, a podcast for women who long to feel, express, and be who they truly are. This is Cherie Burton, your host, and today we've got you a treat. We've got Leslie Householder, who for me is literally a household theme in terms of fempreneuring and business and growing and thinking wealth mindset, not in a materialistic way, but in a spiritual work way, because when you have more, you can give more. Her book, The Jack Rabbit Factor, honestly shifted my husband and I into a new way of thinking about our finances and about life and about giving back and about spirituality as it relates to um, the acquisition of resources. And this was like 15 years ago, I think. I can't remember how long ago it was that I read her book. She helps people all over the world apply these principles of faith that are linked into receiving like your goals and vanquishing those foes that you have and really just showing up strongly in your life intentionally and claiming what your heart desires. Uh, We have a great community growing Women Seeking Wholeness on Facebook. You can join our page group there. And also just again, just just sharing it with your friends and letting them know what this is about. Recognizing that we are in a period of awakening of the feminine on this planet. And there's so much that we can do as a community to validate and empower one another. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you. I'm so grateful that you're agreeing to be on. I was kind of fangirling over you. (laughs) And I'm glad we've had a chance to personally connect because, uh, as I was telling you, and for the listeners, so just so they know, your book, The Jackrabbit Factor, um, that I read, I want to say maybe 10 or 11 years ago, was actually my husband devoured it in less than 48 hours. And then he handed it to me and said, this is like required reading for us. (laughs) Um, So that, that book was a really pivotal piece on my journey to being an entrepreneur and to thinking bigger. And in, in the sense that I wanted to stay aligned on a spiritual path but I also knew that I wanted to create abundance in my life. And I just didn't know I was raised kind of in poverty. Um, That's nothing against my parents. It was just the times. I mean, they're baby boomers and they came out of parents who were in the great depression and my parents had a lot of mouths to feed, but um, I always knew, like I told you earlier, when I was young, I was going to, try to find a way to have what I wanted. I was going to try to be wealthy, but not just marry some guy and depend on that. But I wanted that. I I wanted someone to tell me that was okay. (laughs) Right. Right. And so your book, The Jackrabbit Factor was, um, and and I would encourage everyone to read it because, um, and I want the backstory from you. I have a little bit of your story on that, but how that came to be for you, because I know you had your own kind of like, life series of life experiences that landed you in a similar place of wanting more. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, uh, when I was young, I, I remember looking at people with money or living a better lifestyle than, than what we were living and thinking, oh, if that's going so well, they must, they must, I had associated wealth with unhappiness I don't know where that came from. My mom swears she didn't give it to me. You know, that's not how she thinks. They did struggle a lot. Um, but somehow I had just decided that if uh, if I wanted to be happy, I needed to stay humble, and that meant poor. Mm-hmm. And I remember reading a book called Charlie that glamorized newlyweds struggling. And I just thought, oh, that's so romantic to get married and struggle and have the plant hanging off the shower rod in the in in the kitchen, you know, just because you were in this tiny apartment. And it just seemed so glamorous. And so I had this vision that I'd get married and things would be hard financially. And isn't that romantic? Kind <laughs> <laughs> of created that, I guess. I don't know. But um, I also I also had a deep conviction for what I wanted my family life to be like. I wanted a strong family. I wanted to help my kids um, achieve their highest potential. And, you know, the, the older you get and the older your kids get, the more you realize that it's not as easy to do when money is tight. Yeah. 
um, you know, if you want to send them to a, a summer camp that you know will change their heart, if, if you want to send them to lessons so that they can develop their talents, these, you know, you can get creative and do trades and things, but there comes a point where it just would be nice if money weren't the problem. Mm -hmm. it won't and so we got married and things were hard. Uh, we were working multiple jobs. We were trying to go to school and we wanted me to be able to stay at home with the babies when they came. And when my first baby came, uh, we were ready to just let me quit and operate on faith that, you know, this is what we believe God wants for our family is the stay at home mom traditional picture. But we weren't financially prepared to do that. But we thought if we just had enough faith that miracles would happen. And what that started was, you know, I quit my job and we very quickly ended up in debt and things started getting harder and then there'd be a job loss and there'd be medical bills and the car wouldn't work. And it just, it piled and piled and piled to the point where I, you know, seven years of this and I'm wondering, where's our miracle? Aren't we doing what's right? Aren't we trying, you know? And, and, um, and how did you define, cause I see that a lot too. I mean, I, I do business mentoring with people on all um, points on the spectrum of, um, wealth and poverty. And it feels like that's a predominant theme, what you just shared. If I just have enough faith, mm -hmm. like um, how did you define faith back then in terms of this construct with, with? I thought if I was righteous, I would prosper. Mm -hmm. um, and by righteous, I, I mean, you know, paying a tithe, an honest tithe, um, serving where I could, um, giving other moms a break if they needed one by watching their kids. Um, uh, it, I don't know. It was just all the Sunday school answers, um, pray, <laughs> read your scriptures. Um, what else is there? Uh, people do this with a myriad of issues, health. Like if I, if I just read my scriptures, prayed, worshiped, served and wore myself out and like, was just super connected to God, everything would fall in place. And it's kind of a, kind of a blow upside the head when it doesn't work out that way. Yeah. Like, wait a minute. What, what it's, do I believe? Well, and there's a false dichotomy of a prosperity gospel. I don't know if you've heard that phrasing before. Uh -huh. And it, it's like, um, it's, it's exactly what we're talking about. If I just check this list and if I just do all these things, I'm going to have what I want. <laughs> God's right. entitled to give me that. Or, or taken a step further, people believe that the wealthier you are, the more blessed you are, yeah. the more favored you are, the mm -hmm. more righteous you are. And that's not true either. Right. That's not true either. And what, I mean, can I jump right to the conclusion that oh, I find? Oh, yes, please. Here? Um, and this was a huge, and it took me a long time to get to this place, but um, when I finally got it, and this wasn't just sitting around going through the motions, this was a, a deep and um, a hunger, a, a search for what do I need to change about the way I think? And, and somehow I knew that I needed to change the way I think. There was something instinctive about that because we would have another setback and I would think, well, what am I supposed to think about this? Because yeah. I, I believe that if I that could That must not be a true principle because I did that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I didn't have... <laughs> and I think I just deep down knew that if, if life were to throw me another blow... And if I could just think right about that blow, then on the other side of it, everything would be okay. Somehow I knew that I was the, the common denominator, mm. that I was the, the way I thought was the determining factor. I just didn't know how to think. So I'm looking for, I'm looking for someone to teach me how do I think. And it is all through the scriptures, but sometimes it takes pointing it out in a certain way so that I understand it. And so my husband and I, we were going to... Um, different seminars and different teachers and, and of course, church and reading scripture and, and conferences and stuff. And we would get little nuggets. We would get um, 
someone would be telling a story of how they'd come from poverty to wealth, and they might say one thing in their 40-minute presentation that landed with me and changed something about the way I thought. And so I would take notes like, oh my gosh, that, that is that is huge for, you know, and I could give you examples, but what I ended up doing is over those seven years, I'm taking notes and I'm, I'm gathering these nuggets. And there was finally one, one moment where it's like that last tumbler fell into place. I think about a combination lock and you know, the kind that have the little dials on it and you have to mm-hmm. turn one to the right number. I still have nightmares of being in high school and junior high and not <laughs> opening my leopard locker combination. <laughs> well, I picture, I picture the lock is shut and we have to turn each number into the right, you know, the each dial to the right number before the lock will spring open. And for someone like me coming from where my mindset was before I had over a hundred of those little numbers that needed to be put into place. And each nugget that I got at the next conference or at the next reading or at the next book, whatever, would put one of those into place. And I'd be like, oh, that's, that's truth. I get it. That's truth. But nothing changed. And then the next one, oh, that's truth too, but nothing changed. Oh, that's truth. But nothing changed. And, and after seven years of this, you're beginning to wonder, is anything ever going to change? Mm-hmm. You know, and so finally, um, I went to an event. There was a speaker there who explained some things, and he referenced a verse from um, from the Doctrine and Covenants, which is a scripture in the for the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. And it said, and I'm going to paraphrase, but it says, "There is a law irrevocably decreed before the foundations of the world that if we." obtain a blessing, it's because we were obedient to the law connected to that blessing. And so essentially, if we want to have a certain blessing, we need to understand and learn and obey the law connected to that blessing. And so he had my attention because he was not a member of that faith, but I was and, and am. And so he had my attention. I'm like, well, what are these laws? I've been searching. I've been searching. And so he explained how things work. He's like, you know, if you think this way, then these things will happen that way. Was it and kind of the, the think and grow rich kind of? Kind rich? of, yes, but I'd already that. read that book and it was just a little nugget. It was a nugget. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, I get that, but why isn't anything changing? You know, or I'm trying to apply it, but something's missing. And so it was along those lines. It was along the lines of um, think positive, dream big. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been hearing that for seven years. What else? What else? What else? Right? Mm-hmm. And so I'll just give you one little example. There were, he, he, he presented eight laws, which I ended up training with him to facilitate his classes. His name was Bob Proctor. Oh Maybe. yeah, Bob Proctor. He's a big guy. He's a big deal. Big in the industry. Definitely. So this was who had shared uh, he, uh, his angle, his take on these laws. And it made sense. It wasn't hypey. It wasn't rah, rah, you can do it. It was, look, you live like this, you think like this, this will happen. It's right. just, uh, you know, the, this is the law that's connected to prosperity. And so here's an example of a piece of it. I used to pray, pray my heart out when things were looking disastrous Uh, We needed a bunch of money before the end of the month, and we didn't know where it would come from. I'm on my knees saying, oh, Heavenly Father, please save us. Because if if there if if something doesn't change, um, the bank's going to be calling me, the the car may get, it's going to sit in the driveway, it wasn't going to get repoed, because we never, we were, we were driving old cars that, you know, wouldn't even be repoed, (laughs) they're just that bad. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but we couldn't get it to work or we'd be, we, you know, and I'm, and I'm picturing all the things that are going to go wrong if the money doesn't come while I'm asking for help. Okay. That is breaking a <laughs> law, and I didn't know it mm. instead, instead, instead. And this is, this could change a person's life if they would ponder on this and apply it. Instead, I needed to learn to, see myself at the end of the month. What does it look like now that those bills are paid? What does it look like now that the miracle has transpired? I don't have to know what the miracle is going to be, 
Hmm. I don't have to know where the money's going to come from, but can I see myself at the end of the month looking back on it saying, oh my word, that was amazing. Look what God did for us. Look what opportunities he opened for us. Look what, look what um, resources came available to us. Look what um, maybe handyman, jo- who knows what, what opportunities would open for us to get us through the month. But could I see myself feeling grateful that it happened? Hmm. Could I see myself feeling grateful and amazed? My God, he did it. He did it. Hmm. Can I feel that while I'm asking for help? And and so my prayers changed from, um, I'm so upset, help me, you know, I don't know what to do. Aren't you there? You know, it changed from that to, Father in heaven, you know our needs. I can see, I can see us at the end of this month feeling grateful. And I'm going to pray that prayer right now. Thank you for sending the help we needed. Thank you for finding, for opening our eyes to the way that you already prepared for us. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you for that. And then I would spend the rest of the month choosing calm. It's a choice. You know, I, it didn't mean that I knew how it was going to happen. It didn't mean that there wasn't still fear to manage. But mm-hmm. when I feel the fear, I would, I would, flip a switch in my head and say, I choose faith and I'm going to move my feet and I'm going to do whatever thoughts come to mind that might help me get closer to solving this problem. I'm going to pray like it depends on God, but I'm not going to work like it depends on me. And so it's um, the thing that we are afraid to do though. We are afraid to dare to believe to the end Mm. because we're afraid we might get disappointed. We're afraid that we might uh, not experience a miracle. And then what? Does that mean I'm going to w- worry about whether or not I believe in God? Well, what? Well, no, th- you got to turn that off too. That's the same thing. We picture the worst case scenarios and ask for help. Yeah. We, we need to. Picture- it's fear based it because is. and scarcity based. It is. And so that, that is one little key that flipped, flipped the switch for us. I tell you, we came away with this knowledge, with this new knowledge. Cause I, pro- I, I tell you, the cure for fear is not courage. The cure for fear is knowledge. And when you get the knowledge that you need, you know what to have faith in. Mm. You know why faith is making things happen. It's that rare kind of faith that causes things to happen. Mm. You don't believe because it's going to work out. It works out because you believed. That's an interesting paradigm shift. I, I, you know, I've always believed in like vision boards and um, I have a whole story with, you know, I told you my story of my two children that are adopted kind of holding that spiritual in my spiritual mind. I, I write a book called Drawing on the Powers of Heaven. And that was like, whole, I don't know if you've read that, but it was like holding this in my mind's eye, pleading with God. But there was nothing in there about kind of what you're saying, which feels like it puts me more in a space of creator with God, as opposed to just, Hey God, send me everything. (laughs) Right. I know, you know what you're doing. I'm really a peon right over here. And I thought that was the most spiritual way to be. I misunderstood humility. Mm. Humility is not, I'm always second or I'm always destitute of spirit of soul or I'm always less than in your eyes, God, you are so mighty and I am so small. I think that gets perpetuated and it damages a lot of faith traditions. I see it a lot in Christian communities. Um, What I have learned and what you're affirming is that we are literally co-creating all of the time. I had a life coaching client who I don't, she had some evangelical background. I'm not exactly sure. She, she lived in Minnesota and she loved everything. Like she came to a workshop. She loved everything I was saying. So she hired me as a coach, but she, she quickly fired me because I had the audacity to call her a creator. She thought that was absolute blasphemy. Mm. I said, no, you don't understand. Like you are always creating. <laughs> like we are always creating we are creating with our thoughts, negative or positive. I'm not saying you are the creator, 
I'm saying you are a creator for your life and for the people around you. And she just couldn't, um, she just couldn't make that leap. Yeah. But yeah, we are co-creating all the time. I love what you were saying about um, kind of giving that gratitude in advance. Mm -hmm. Uh, It seems like that had to be a leap of faith because we don't want to seem like, what's the word? Presumptuous. Presumptuous or demanding. Yeah. We don't want to demand it or. Yeah. There's a, oh gosh. I'm trying to think how I've, I've heard it put before. Um, oh, I'm going to actually pull this up because you keep, you can keep going off. I'll, I'll, yeah. It's just, I, that's what I had to grapple with within my being was like, who am I to come before God and say, here is what I see. Here's what I would really like to create. Yeah. Um, and thank you for, you know, but I knew what I wanted in my heart. I just, there's a scripture that kept coming to me. It was Paul, I think, talking about boldly going before the throne of grace. Mm-hmm. And I just picture myself going before God um, boldly, but that whole like throne of grace is like, yeah, you, you can have that. Why can't you have that? That's your birthright. Yeah. And like, I, yeah, I want to travel. I want to, you know, have all these kids and I want to this. And this. But then I got to thinking like, how can I teach this to someone else who's not, who wants that too? And that's not showing up for them. That makes me look like, well, who does she think she is? <laughs> well, and, and I I think manage if, that. We, <laughs> if we pause and listen and go inward a little bit and find out what God's vision is for us, we may be surprised to find out that his vision is even bigger than what we've imagined for ourselves. Yeah. You know, um, but I found this, this is something that, that I was thinking about this idea. How do I, how do I describe what we're doing when we, when we set a goal and co-create with God and involve that rare kind of faith that causes things to happen? How do we, how do we define that? And, and this is, this is where, this is how I define expecting success. It's not a feeling of entitlement, but it is a knowing. It's not demanding, but it is allowing. It's not needing, but it is anticipating. It's not boastful, but it is grateful. Mm, I love that. Oh my gosh. You need to, can you send that to me later? <laughs> yeah, definitely. definitely. I'd love to put that in the show notes. I, that's amazing. Um, because that, that pretty much delineates the whole, like, no, you're not being, you're not being a spoiled little brat going before God saying, this is me. This is what I want. <laughs> it's right. an act. It's a total act of surrender to what already is in your heart. Right. Right. And you know, here's another, here's another piece that has really been a pivotal concept for me. And that is, you know, because oftentimes people worry about, well, what if I set this goal and it doesn't work out and maybe it wasn't God's will for me to have that. I mean, we need to, we need to be mindful of that. That's, yeah. that's a legitimate concern. And it's for good reason too, because I have, I've discovered that these laws, these principles, they work for worthy goals and they work for stupid goals. I've set some really stupid goals but because the principles are in place, the, these laws are like, they're like natural laws. They're like gravity. It's in place. It affects us. It works on us. And as we align with it, we achieve the things we envision. But it, it doesn't distinguish between good goals and bad goals. It doesn't distinguish between worthy or stupid or even... Yeah, it doesn't care if, you, if you're worthy or not. It doesn't. And, and and so what I've, what I've come to is that when I set a goal and I'm like, this is what I really envision for my life. This is what causes my soul to feel like it's expanding and growing when I imagine this. I think it's good. I think it's good. It feels right. I, I can't let myself get paralyzed over the fear of what if it's right or wrong. I'm going to move my feet and let God steer me. With that intention, please steer me if I'm wrong. But um, my my whole oh, mindset around this has, has come to a place of, 
I'm going to do my part so that I am not the limiting factor in what mm. God can do here. So if I put myself out there for this intention and it doesn't happen, I'm going to make sure it's not me as the reason that it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. I want to just be, I don't want to be the limiting factor in what God can do. I'm going to, I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to make my best effort. I'm going to, to keep my mindset where it needs to be, to be in alignment with these laws of thought. And then I hand it to God. And if it's, if, if for any reason it shouldn't happen for my, for my personal well being, for my family's well being, because I want, I want, what's best for us, even when I don't always understand what that might be. Yeah. And I can get to the end of that and say, you know what, if it doesn't happen, I can be at peace with it. Cause I knew I wasn't the limiting factor. Yeah. Like you were saying before, like you noticed you were the common denominator when things were coming down. <laughs> right. It wasn't the, it wasn't the exteriors. It was how, what do I need to align within me so that I can receive what is there for me? Um, So I have a question for you. How do you think, and then we'll, we'll kind of flip back to your story too, because I'd love to see how it all culminates. Um, How do you think, because I meet, like I said, I meet, I meet people along the spectrum of people who are really struggling just to pay the electric bill. And I've, I've been there, so I know that feeling. And then people who just um, probably, just have a lot of wealth coming in. Mm-hmm. So I meet people and I'm talking about women just for our intents and purposes, because this is a podcast for women. Um, and, and there's a lot of old paradigms and traditions that are in place, I think for women in terms of like, Oh, you know, what is, what is the law of women making money? Are you following me? Like, is God saying, oh, because you're a mother or, oh, because you're a woman or, oh, because this or that. So I meet a lot of women who struggle with that. Like they legitimately want to do God's will. And they also, you know, which in their perception is just like focusing on their kids. And I, I have to really tread lightly here because I know that motherhood is a high, high calling. I always tell people motherhood isn't your highest calling. Someday your kids are going to be gone and it's going to be you. And if you have, if you still have poverty consciousness, you're going to, you know, your kids, your kids themselves cannot bring you happiness. They cannot bring you to your highest calling of joy. It's that's inside you. But anyway, my bigger, my bigger question is I meet a lot of women who want to create their purpose. They're trying to find their purpose. They're trying to also like they, they know they've, they've been born into an age now where they can kind of have it all. Like you're saying, like they could have these things. Um, and maybe they could have it all, just not right now, right? Because they have these desires. But what they're really struggling with, what the deeper struggle is, is I'm not going to be spiritual if I try to do, I I have to sacrifice one for the other. I either have to sacrifice motherhood, um, being a good mom, in other words, Mm -hmm. or I have to sacrifice what I want to create, what I feel called to create. So both of them are calling. <laughs> yeah. Are you following kind of my question? Yeah. Like they're going to be unspiritual in some w- respect if they step into a business or a project or an entrepreneurial path, even humanitarian work. Um, there's a there's just this little devil on their shoulder going, oh, but right. Oh, I've wrestled with that. I have wrestled with that, and because that's all I wanted was to be a mom. I never saw myself with a career and um, it's interesting because I think there are, I think there are little seeds planted in our hearts when, as we're growing up and as we're getting older, that um, we have, we have a mission to fulfill while we're here on this planet. And that is, uh, it's motherhood. It's also, um, it's also a contribution to society um, now, how do you reconcile that when both of them can be so demanding? And there are a couple things that helped me because I, <laughs> I look back and I think as a child, all I wanted to be was grow up and be a mom and, and build yeah. a family and, and have that. 
And then when I was 12, I attended an event. Um, it was a summer camp or something where we went to listen to a speaker and it was a, a youth speaker that really, really, it changed my world. It changed my life. It changed the way I saw myself. It changed the decisions that I, w- I would make. It put me on a path that brought me so much happiness, that one speaker. And I remember thinking, I want to be a speaker one day. Mm-hmm. Now, it didn't, it didn't dawn on me in my head that, what, that there might be a conflict between the, the challenges of motherhood and trying to be a speaker and stuff. I, I really didn't, I wasn't looking for a career in speaking, but I thought one day I want to affect lives that way. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even know what my message would be. I just, I just wanted to participate in what God had done for me through a speaker. I wanted to participate in that kind of work. And I think, I think that was a little seed that God planted in me. And so fast forward, I'm having a family. I'm struggling with motherhood. <clears throat> I, I have this breakthrough where, you know, that final tumbler falls into place. And within three months, we've tripled our income after seven years of this pain. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I have to teach what I've learned. There are other families struggling. There are other, there are other moms who are depressed like I've been. There are kids who need, who need their moms and they, they just aren't around. Moms who don't want to be working. I'm not saying anything to the women who want to and love to work. I'm speaking to those who are like me who didn't want to work. I wanted to be a mom. Right. And so... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would swing back and forth and it was a constant wrestle, but a couple things brought me some peace and keep and helped me keep going in the hard times. And one of them was I was at, I was listening to Sharon Lecter, who is the author of the rich dad, poor, poor dad book with Robert Kiyosaki. She mm, it's a good it. book. It is a good book. But as I was listening to her and she's a woman and she raised a family and she said this, she had the whole audience stand on, stand squarely over their feet and said, show me balance perfectly over your two feet. So we stand there and she says, now pay attention to the energy in the room. And we're, okay. We didn't really know what we were looking for because there wasn't contrast yet. And she says, okay, now, now I want you to kind of swing your weight from side to side over each foot, shift your weight back and forth. She says, feel the energy in the room. And the, the movement felt lighter. It was lighter. And she says, now with your feet squarely with your, with your feet squarely balanced, you know, over both feet, um, try to go somewhere. (laughs) And she said, what you can do is, you know, you'll swing to one side when your work needs attention and then you'll notice your kids need attention. So you swing to that side and you give the, give the kids the attention they need and, and until they're, they're operating fine again. And then, Oh, you're, work is starting to fall apart again. So you swing over there. And I used to think that that was just madness. Can't I find balance? Can't I create a schedule where I'm addressing everything every day and keeping things going? <laughs> and she says, balance is a myth. Yeah. It's, totally temporary, it's temporary seasons of imbalance is what I think Stephen Covey talked about, where shifting your weight from one to another, back and forth, back and forth. When you can come to peace with that, you move you move. And, and, and I also have a firm, firm belief in unseen help. I've, I've experienced it where, uh, I'm juggling too many things. And my prayer is, Oh, father, help my family. I'm here needing to do this thing. And my family needs your help and having the spirit confirmed to my heart. I've got them. I'm helping yeah. And you can pray for that. You can pray for angelic teams. <laughs> and we have that right as it within both within our own beings and those we have stewardship over and those we love. I love this. I um yeah, I've always said creation is meant to be messy. Yeah. Oh, well you you know, you say that there's a book called You Squared. Uh, by Price Pritchett, and he says in there, on the way to a life-saving surgery, in the middle of a life-saving surgery, it would appear that there's been a murder in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to... That is so not, classic. <laughs> not take a snapshot of today and let it define our life. We're, we're doing surgery. Yeah. Well, and birth is messy. 
It is. <laughs> and it's painful. And when and you go, and this is totally like a metaphor in the scriptures too, when a woman's in travail and then she's a certain stage of labor, um, anytime something is ready to be birthed, whether it's an idea, a project, a business, a child, <laughs> a new idea, a new transition, it's painful. And, and most people, and this is what I've learned in my journey, and maybe you can speak to this as well. I see people almost ready, like they are laboring, they are breathing hard, they are, things are out of balance, things are a wreck around them. And they're like, oh, and like, this must mean from God, this is not spiritual, this is not right, things are not falling into place. And they bail, they yeah. give up right when they're ready to give birth to that thing, that new creation. Yeah. And can I share, this is, I, I know, I know our listeners have probably heard this, but it, it's worthy of a reminder. There is a verse in Proverbs that I love, Proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman. Mm-hmm. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it in the way that um, I, I worked it into my book, Portal to Genius, which is about this very thing we're talking about, uh, finding and fulfilling uh, your mission, divine mission, and, and which evolves over time throughout our life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we'll have different stages. You, you hear about women who threw their heart and soul into raising their family. And when the kids are gone, they're like, who am who I? Who am I? Who am I? What, do, what is my contribution? And, and um, so this is about the virtuous woman who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. This is not the King James version. It's, it's written a a little more uh, modern, but I'll continue. She works willingly with her hands. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and gives meat to her household. She considers a field and buys it. She's in real estate. With yeah, the fruit, <laughs> she's a businesswoman. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. Her merchandise is good. She's a merchant. Her candle goes out not by night. She stretches out her hand to the poor. Yea, she stretches forth her hands to the needy. She makes fine linen and sells it. She's on Etsy and delivers <laughs> girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. She's a teacher. She's a speaker. And in her, her tongue is the law of kindness. She looks well to the ways of her household and eats not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. She's an example to her children of industry. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excel them all. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Mm. We forget, we forget that we are more than one (laughs) thousand. We're we're, We're faceted. Yeah. And I think at this time of the earth... Um, I believe the souls that have incarnated right now, the, the female souls in particular, we are, we are going to dispel all of the old paradigms that kept us in the space of heels and apron and a smile. Yeah. Um, we, and that is not to denigrate the role of a housekeeper or, but what is a housekeeper? It's more than making the house clean and feeding people and raising children. It's your body is the temple, your body is the house. And when you own that, you own the strength and glory and everything that you just delineated on that Proverbs 31. When women get that they have these capacities, they're going to, they're going to magnify their gifts. No one's going to squelch their spiritual gift expression. They're going to rise up and say, no, I, I want to do this business. No, oh, I, I want to, I want to create this project. I, you know, and I feel this like millennial, like you have millennial, I know you have at least one millennial daughter. So you told me about her, but um, my, my kids are kind of teaching me this. Like I thought I was, I was pretty um, forward thinking in terms of like roles with women and whatever. Um, but my young adult children and their friends are teaching me a whole other level. Like they're not even feeling the guilt that I was feeling at their ages. Like how am I going to balance my academic pursuits with being a mom? They don't even have that struggle. They're just, I'm just going to do it. 
I'm just going to find a way to make it work. I don't care what this religious leader says, or I don't care what my friend's, um, you know, mother says, or, you know, they just, they just have this knowing. And I'm like, I think that that, that it's like, you have to wait for this permission slip. Mm -hmm. Most of the women I work with, they're waiting for a permission slip. They're waiting for someone to go, yep, it's okay. And not only is it okay, if you don't do it, a part of you will die. A part of you will become numb, shut off, and you'll wonder why you're feeling depressed. You'll wonder why you feel incomplete or something's missing or you feel um, you're always going to be comparing and going, well, she's doing that and I can't, or this person is achieving that and I can't. And you won't be consciously doing that. Right, right. On the subconscious level, you will suffer and you will not know why. And it's because you let someone else tell you, wait for you to give you that permission and you didn't give it to yourself. Yeah. And I think, I think the piece that's missing in the conversation is the idea that um, we should be able to do it all and handle it all and be it all. And that can be a trap too, because Absolutely. I think the piece that needs to be held on to is a very conscious decision of priorities because there are times where the conflicts are so great. I have to know what my priorities are. And my priority is always family first, right? Family first that, that other things can slide. Other things can fall apart. If I have to choose to sacrifice something on the altar, it will not be my family. And so what I've, what I've learned though, is that, um, as I keep, um, as I hold tight to the values and principles that, that are true and that do um, contribute to strengthening the family because that is the fundamental unit of society, but that as I put that rock in my jar first, there are opportunities for me to expand my own soul and make other contributions that bring me joy that make me a better mom when my kids get home because I'm happy. Um, these are the things, but we can get out of whack when we let the family die on the altar in pursuit yeah. of our goals. And so it is a fine line to walk. And, and I, was, I think a lot of women are really afraid of that. You know, when the pendulum shifts in the creation mode, mm-hmm. um, that it's a permanent, that's going to be a permanent thing, but maybe you'd agree with me here. I think, because my children have always seen me do all, all these things and um and I've experienced a lot of mother guilt <clears throat> you know and I told you my kids have there's a wide range in ages of my kids um one thing that I have learned and it's been the hard way is that I've had to be open with them and say okay I'm going to go through a season <clears throat> there was a season in 2010 where I was really building my business and I I sat them down and I said, and I said, mommy's going to be really busy for this time. But after this time's over, after this four month period is over, then, you know, you'll get braces. You Maybe we'll go to Disneyland. I don't know. I was like dangling the carrot for them, mm-hmm. but they saw me tired. They saw me get, you know, try to make it all. And I used to be guilty about that. But as I look back, it really taught them to kind of go for their own path. It gave them like like I'm not, I'm going out of the box here. Um, but it, it was for them, it was like their own permission slip. Like, Oh, well, my mom and dad are entrepreneurs. It's, it's not easy. It's, do you have to like work around the clock sometimes? So I've come to them crying in their rooms over the years too. I'm so sorry. Um, they're like, it's okay. Like, I don't feel like it was me feeling that. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, I noticed with my kids, um, there was a period of time where I was constantly feeling guilty about, it was while I was writing the books, I think, especially, um, okay. where, I mean, the dishes would pile up and they were finding their own food and they learned a lot of good <laughs> um, domestic skills by out of necessity. But yeah, <laughs> where I would say, oh, guys, I'm so sorry. This won't be forever. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And they heard apology, apology, apology all the time. And so what I was teaching them that I was doing something wrong. 
Yeah. And, and it shifted when I, when I kind of woke up and realized, wait a minute, I'm doing this because God told me to do this. I'm not doing something wrong. It's hard. It's messy, but I need to change the conversation around it. And so instead I started saying, Hey guys, let me explain what we're doing, how this is helping families. I would share with them some of the, some of the stories that were coming out of people who had read the work or, or, you know, I would, I would share these stories with them and I'd say, this is what God has called us to do. This is what our family is about. And I would enlist their help in the cause. Yes. And that changed things. I was no longer apologizing for not being with them or making them feel like something I was doing was wrong because it wasn't wrong. It was, it, was, it was something that I feel like God got a hold of me and I did it so that I could sleep because I couldn't sleep until the work was done. Yeah. John Maxwell says um, a, a, a mission is something that you really want to do, but a calling is something you have to do. You have to do it. And when your kids see that wrestle, it's really healthy. And I love that you made that distinction because we do get into as women, especially, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And we apologize for showing up. Right. And once you wake up to know, not only should we not apologize, like this is who we are. Um, But what you said before was really key. You know, if you're fi- if you're not putting your family on the altar, <laughs> you know, but but your family also realizes that hey, this is a season. This is like temporary. Bear with me. Come with me. One of the things we did as a family is, um, well, I told my kids early on, I'm like, this is not just a business I'm building. This is a ministry. Yes. And one of the things that has been so humbling is I've been able to take all of our older kids somewhere really cool in the world at least once. And then my daughter and I did a fundraiser to, um, when she was 19, I think when she was 19, to build a women's empowerment center in Africa. And so she saw women in abject poverty. I mean, we were, we were in mud huts. Um, and it was just, it was for me just this full circle moment of like, what if I said no because of my kids? Mm -hmm. What if I would have made them the reason that I didn't show up like this? And I was really messy. There's nothing, I mean, people see the Facebook version of like what you're doing. Um, But, but I'm really honest with people about like, it's hard work. What you were saying before about you know, if if you would have just had it when you were kind of in that messy, those seven years where things were piling up, like, if I just have enough faith, miracles happen. Well, faith requires action. Mm -hmm. This is where people, what I see is that people get stymied where they have this beautiful go ahead from God and they feel so inspired and they go to this training or they read these books or whatever, and they're getting this mentoring and they're like, okay, I'm ready. And, and then they just go back into what I call serial learning. I'm not the one that fra- turned that or coined that phrase, but they become a serial learner because that feels better. They feel the warm fuzzies and it feels really good and they get excited and they would rather stay in that space than do all the risk taking involved in creating what they really want. So putting it into action and, and I see And the reason I brought up that metaphor of the woman giving birth is because that's what I see. I see them, oh, a baby, I'm pregnant. And this is, again, metaphorical, like, oh, the idea. Oh, I love it. It feels amazing. I'm going to have that someday. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want morning sickness. Yeah. (laughs) No way. (laughs) And so, yeah, I mean, it's just becoming like, but I had, in my mind, it had to be a ministry. Yeah. Because I couldn't just say I was out to make money. Right. And it, and it is, it is a ministry what you're doing and, and what I'm doing. I've, I've, I've come to the same conclusion. It's, it is my ministry as well. And the, um, the idea that I, you know, it brings me back to that, the concept of um, truth. If we understand truth or or true, true doctrine, even changes attitude and behavior. And I think people that get stuck in that serial learner mode, um, once they understand 
the truth of how it works, their belief goes through the roof and their action almost becomes automatic because they can't not do what their heart is telling them to do next because now they know they've got the tools they need. And, and can I just share where people can get information on that law, on those laws? Yeah, for please, I was going to ask you. Yeah. So I have a section on my blog. My blog is rarefaith.org rarefaith.org and at, at, uh, there's a section in there called freebies where they'll find the book hidden treasures heaven's astonishing help with your money matters and that's a free download where you can read all about the laws that absolutely shifted everything for us and i have that physical book not an ebook form it's, yeah it's on audible it's in I forgot physical. that you had those on there yeah so they are free downloads all three of my books are free downloads but of course they're also available in paperback audio audible cd's whatever um, I just didn't want to give anybody a, a, a reason or an excuse not to get the information they need. Here's your permission slip, everyone. <laughs> Here's your permission slip. You have no excuses why you can't read this and get the knowledge you need to overcome those fears. And you're going to be motivated to take action just because you know now what to do. Yeah. And I love that you brought that up, that once you have the knowledge, you can't say you didn't know. <laughs> you can't use that excuse. But also you said that's the cure for fear. Yeah. You know, it overrides fear because yeah. you start to feel this rising sense of empowerment like, oh, I get it. It's like understanding gravity for the first time. You know, you, people falling all over the place. Well, once you understand gravity, you know not to go to the edge of the cliff. Okay. Well, now I don't have to be afraid of heights because I just, I don't know. It's a bad analogy, right. but you get it. <laughs> I, I got it. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I love, you know, kind of, let's kind of circle back to how you, you once, okay. So once you realize that you were this common denominator and that the miracle was really your change of the way you were thinking, that that would be kind of the catalyst to bring to pass what you wanted and then going to God and giving that preemptive gratitude. Um, and I've heard people give testimonies in church like that. I heard a guy say, you know, I just want to stand up and like, thank God in advance. <laughs> you know? um, so there's that pa past uh, or that pattern. But what kind of, how did you, what was the real, I know there's eight laws, but, but if you could just like scale it into, you know, kind of for you, what moved the needle? Was it that, was it that prayer, the, the way of praying, like, no, I kind of figured that out later as I was analyzing why things suddenly started working. Um, but the the thing that really moved the needle for us was understanding, um, and and there just there there's not time to share this entire piece with you all. But I'll point our listeners where they can watch the whole thing. Um, is this idea of a stick man? It's a it's a symbolic representation of how our mind works. Um, that gave me a visual in my mind on, okay, when things are looking really bad, this visual aid helped me understand how to think about that so that the thing that happened next was positive. Mm. And it, it's, it was really that simple, not easy, because I'm wrestling with old thought habits but when when the if if some if you go to rarefaith.org in that freebies section there was a, a a little link there that's called the visual aid that changed everything and i've got a full length video on it that you can watch for free but what it did is it helped me know what to do with fear because what happens is you you set an intention or you set a goal you have a vision for what you want to accomplish um, once you see it in your mind as done and feel it, how it's going to feel when it's done, like you pretend like it's already happened so you can know how it feels. Once you have felt it, it changes you. It changes the thoughts that will come into your mind next, like a radio station being tuned into. Like mm -hmm. when you feel it as though it's done, you are like a radio whose dial just changed up to a different frequency. And now you're on a new broadcast of ideas. And so the next ideas that come to you are going to be solutions that actually lead you closer to it instead of perpetuating the same kind of drama and trauma and problems that you've been experiencing thus far. Mm. And so now you've got, you've got inspiration and guidance on what to do next to get you closer to it. And when you go to take action on it, you're going to feel this anxiety because physiologically your subconscious mind has just accepted two truths. One, I'm always broke. 
and the new one, things are abundant. Life is abundant. Well, those are discordant. And that discordance on a physiological level shows up as anxiety. But we interpret it as, oh, this must be bad. I should retreat. Mm. Now, that was a whole lot of teaching in two minutes. But oh, that's great. But whole video at that link, the visual aid that changed everything. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm, I love that you're just offering so much free content because it's, it really is the secret sauce is to see it and feel it. Mm -hmm. That's how we, that's how we spiritually create. Um, And also like, I just want to tell everyone who's listening that we need your gifts. <laughs> you know, we need you to show up. Here's your permission slip, right? Cause, cause the world needs you. The world's waiting for you and not just, and I, I meet a lot of women too, who don't feel any kind of calling outside of like their home and their neighborhood. And I think that's beautiful. I really do. I, I have actually prayed to God to help me be that woman who wants only that. And he's just like laughing at me. Yeah. I'm, saying, yeah. I'm like, um, I really want to be that. But, but anyway, I'm, I'm not cut out for that. I'm, and I used to, like you were saying, you were, you know, going to your kids and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like I kind of was doing that with God. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to tell everyone who's listening that the power is within you. Like you, you are that agent unto yourself that um, your soul has this beautiful capacity to receive everything that you want and everything that is in your heart that's ready to give. And I just want to add to what we were kind of saying that there's a lie that we have to be in balance. And I want to reaffirm that we don't, there's, it's a myth, like you were saying, and you might have it all someday, just not right now. So find out that next inspired step. What is your favorite way for people to find out that next inspired step? How have you navigated with that? Or how have you managed? Because well, I'm assuming you're the kind of person who gets a lot of inspiration and ideas and you got to manage it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes too much. Um, well, the formula is dependable. Absolutely 100% dependable. And I always go back to it because it's where I go when I start feeling lost, confused, not sure what's next, what I should be doing next, how to deal with what I'm facing, whatever it is, is I... I take some time to see myself on the other side of it, see myself with the end that I intend. How do I want things to turn out? And sometimes that looks like, how do I want that meeting in heaven to look? Well done, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what I may imagine if I am trying to sort my life out. I imagine it. I see it. I try to feel it as though it's already happening so that it changes, it changes me at my core on a, even a physiological level. And that puts me on the broadcast that gives me the inspiration on what's next. And I just trust that whatever thoughts I have in trying to solve that problem, whatever thoughts come to me next are going to lead me to that because I have, I have set the intention. Mm -hmm. And I set the intention by seeing it and feeling it. Now I know that the broadcast I'm on is going to, to be aligned with it. But I also want to add this before we finish up. You also have permission to take a break when you need to. I, I was, yes. was, like, <laughs> was going to bring that up. I know you took a massive oh. break. And I was like, I where'd she go? <laughs> I took a six-year break. Um, when I felt like things were spinning out of control in my business in a good way, but just like overwhelming, I, and I'm feeling like I was losing my focus on, on the things that were most important to me and wondering what happened. How did I lose control of, of feeling like I, I was starting to feel like a puppet to God's vision. And I know he didn't want me to feel that way. I know he wants us to feel um, like a partner and, and empowered. Um, but I was feeling like a puppet and like, do I still have agency? That's when I cut my hair just to check and see if I still had agency. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I stepped back and I put it away for about six years. It was kind of running on its own and I would do little things here and there just to, to keep it alive. But as far as building and growing and connecting and everything, I, I stepped away for six years just to make sure that my soul was, was still in the place, in a good place with God, the way I, the way I wanted it to be. And 
he was, he was kind, loving, patient, and understanding through that. And so you have permission to figure out what's next for you, whether it's more now or less now, or you, there's time to figure it out. Yeah. And uh, if you're like me, you um, may have this other paradigm that you were operating from is like, the more that I produce and the more that I do for people, the greater my reward in heaven or the greater I am to God. Or um, you may have had some kind of belief around that. Um, and what I have learned, because I still have to wrestle with that, I have a real achievement focus. I've always been a high achiever. I've always um, had a worth-based performance. That's kind of one of my life wounds is trying to work through that, even though I logically don't believe that. <laughs> um, so I, I love what you're saying because you're just as productive and you're doing just as much of your calling when you take those seasons of just being. And Can I share something with you that yeah. may surprise people. If any of, if anyone listening knows who Bob Proctor is, he's a, he is a goal achievement guru. I mean, he is, he's the man, <laughs> he's the man, he's the man. And I mentored with him for a year and I was, I had, I'd gotten to a place where I was tuned into this broadcast of ideas that was just a, a, a flood and I realized there is not enough time in my lifetime to act on all of them. And it was puzzling to me. I had another mentor explain to me that once, you're, once your mindset is up there, you're just, you're just tuned into that broadcast. It's not all for you. You're just listening to a station that happens to have all these great ideas. doesn't mean they're all yours. Mm -hmm. But it, it, anyway, back to Bob Proctor. Um, I was kind of, I was throwing out all these, all these ideas, things that I was going to do to, to generate this wealth and everything. And, and, but inside I felt like my next step needed to be journaling. It wasn't action oriented. It was, it was getting centered and his assistant told me later and, and he, he said, yeah, do that. But his assistant told me later, she says, you may be the only person he has ever told ever said it's okay to journal as an action step because he could see I was going nuts with too many actions. Mm. Like, chill back, chill back a little bit and get, get some clarity, just journal, think, you know, so it, it, it's, it's okay. You are being productive. Sometimes the most productive thing you can do is to be in a quiet place and imagine the future you're, you're wanting to create. That is one of the most productive things you could ever do. Mm, I love that. And again, he had to give you that permission, right? Sometimes exactly. God comes through yeah. another person that you respect and they're like, hey, take a breather. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm assuming that you've gotten some real gems and truth and added knowledge in your season of journaling that you wouldn't have gotten trying to kill it in business or whatever. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, I've, I've really enjoyed this discussion and I feel like, you know, I think it's really validating for other women of faith to hear what we're talking about because, and, and I hope that some of our listeners who will take it in the spirit we intended, which is of course, like your relationships are your most important asset in this life. It's not what you build or create. It's, it's your relationships. That's, and the relationship to yourself looks like, I've got to, I've got to show up and serve in, in these arenas. So that tension, I just meet a lot of women who have that life tension, you know, kids, callings and businesses and projects. So, so let, let those seasons come where you're letting things be messy and the dishes can pile up and the kids can pick up the slack. Um, but, but the highest, and I just actually posted this on my Facebook and I was like, ah, this is going to sound really heretical to some people, but I'm like, um, a, a woman's highest calling is not motherhood. A woman's highest calling is to nurture her sacred sovereign soul. And what I meant by that was if we are no good as, as mothers <laughs> or if we are very little value as mothers when we haven't done when we haven't checked in and listened to what our soul is saying and our heart is saying, and we haven't aligned with our creator to find out what he, and I would add she as divine parents would have us show up and be. 
Um, and one, one really quick thing to add to this, I, I was mentoring someone once who was having this, this same struggle and she's super smart and really ambitious. And she said one day she was in the temple and she was praying and she was meditating and she was, again, she was like browbeating herself and I'll do everything. If you, you know, she's like, God, if you want me to set, and she has kids, she's like, if you want me to sacrifice this dream and that's part of your plan is that I have all these dreams and I sacrifice them just because of my children um, and what's happening with my kids, I'll do it. Just say the word and I will do it. And she's like, he literally, like, she's like, I literally got slapped by the spirit. And it was like, why do you think I sent those souls to you? Mm. I didn't send them to you so you could just cater to them. I, and I'm paraphrasing, but it was, it, it was like the download she got was I sent them to you so they could see you doing this thing. Mm. That's the exact reason that I sent them into to your care. I love so, that so much. Yeah. And, and so I, I feel like, because I do have that same life tension. My kids range in age from four to 24. And um, I think that, you know, with God sending me these last two children so much later in life, <laughs> I was 43 when Eli was born and 45 and a half when Emma was born. 45 and a half. I got to add that half in there because it's pretty significant. <laughs> and um, it's just been this real interplay. What you're saying about that woman, Sharon, who was saying, okay, now stand like this. It's so true. Like, I've been destabilized and in a way that I never expected at this stage of my life. And at the same time, it's just, I'm learning. It's just kind of that dance, you know, and, and the spirit will tell you moment by moment. Okay. Stop. Just because God says you for you to do something one time doesn't mean that he means that you stay that in that one thing forever. Right. And, and that's the dance. It's being open. And, and like, there might be some days where I have a full schedule and then one of my kids gets sick and I'm like, dang it. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I'm like, oh, that was divine. Cause, cause I needed a, a clear schedule today for me too. And so just honoring when those things, when those opportunities and circumstances kind of align, it's always for our highest good. And you said the word trust. So do you want to kind of round us out with how, how do you and how can we stay in that place of trust where we kind of know or can trust that things are going to work out for our highest good if we, if we start to create these miracles, if we start to change our thoughts and stuff, how, how can we stay in that place of trust? you know, I think it's, we have to experiment with it. Um, it's, it's not always natural. It, it's not natural to trust in, um, in things working out when all appearances indicate everything opposite of that. Um, but if we experiment with trust in the bill that's due on Tuesday, and we experiment with trust in larger and larger things, we learn to trust God in the mechanics of our entire life, the, in, in, in our children. We learn to trust in the big things. Um, some, sometimes we may even be concerned about the condition of our own soul, and we have to learn how to trust God with that but we can't trust him with the $35 electric bill. <laughs> and so it's, I think, I think I really believe that these life challenges of mortality of the, these temporal concerns are given to us as gifts where we can practice trust and faith and practice um, partnering with God to overcome those challenges so that we build confidence in that relationship and we know that a, a small miracle is no harder for him. A big miracle is no harder for him than a small miracle. And so if we participate in these daily miracles, it gives us, it gives us evidence and fodder and memories to draw upon when we need to apply that faith in the life challenges, in the wayward child, in the health crises, in the, 
in the bigger things. And so we can look at these daily challenges as a gift. Okay, here's an opportunity to practice my faith, and I'm going to do that today. I'm going to trust God today, and let's see what happens. I love that. I love the, the um, kind of that metaphor of like the, the electric bill, you know, <laughs> um, because we have these needs in our physical sphere, and sometimes I get so heady with creation that I, you know, I need to just come back to like, it's the next thing that's in front of me. And how do, how am I creating and managing and working with God in this thing right now? And well, thank you, Leslie. This has been really an enlightening discussion. And I think our listeners are going to love this, um, this permission slip. <laughs> <laughs> And, and for sure, everyone, make sure that you go to her website and check out. It's uh, rarefaith.org under her freebies, correct? And getting yes. those eight laws of with the hidden treasures as well as the visual age, visual aid. Um, what is it that changes everything? Is that it the changed name of it? Everything. it? Changed everything. Changed everything. I'm going to get that myself. I'm going to go run over and do, and do that right now. But thank you again, Leslie, so much for your wisdom and insight. Thank you for doing this with me today. I had a great time and I think it's going to help a lot of people. For sure. I don't know about you, but my goal in life is to have that rare kind of faith that causes things to happen. I think about curing fear through knowledge and just building up our faith through, you know, setting a goal, seeing it, seeing the end, really getting intentional and proactive around what we actually want and then taking the steps forward to move and create it. Let's go to her website, rarefaith.org. You can find those freebies there. And then I also encourage you to come to my website, shereeburton.com, and also to join our discussion in the Women Seeking Wholeness Facebook group, because we are going to be diving into this topic of rare faith and how we develop those muscles and how we support each other along the way. 